Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruid and I'm the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Martin Maus. Martin is a professor of African linguistics at Leiden University. His research focuses on the description of Cushitic languages, including Iraku and Alagua, as well as the exploration of language and identity, valency changing verbal derivations, and the languages of East and West Africa. Please join me in welcoming uh, Martin as he gives uh, the Rift Valley webinar uh, series your free keynote speech titled Cultural Research in the Tanzanian Rift Valley, Memories, Methods, Motivations, and Materials. Thank you, Anna. Welcome, nice to see you all. Um, uh, thank, uh, thanks to the Rift Valley Network organization who uh, asked me to, to give the opening speech of this uh, season. Um, and they asked me some time ago and I gave them this title with the idea that yes, I would like to, to think about the history of the studies of uh, the Tanzania Rift Valley and then philosophize a little bit about it. Well, it was fun to, uh, to reread a lot of the old sources and I, I nearly got lost in it. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's so fascinating to, uh, to read the old German explorers and, 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 and what they observed, etc. So let me try to keep uh, the time. So, I see this this presentation as uh, as in the, in the area in the in the discipline of the history of science. So I, I um, at the end for the, mainly at the end I will think a little bit about okay what are the the continuities in in how um, science was done in this area of the world a uh, hundred years ago and now there is a growing discipline of colonial linguistics and. In a way, this may fit there, but then it will be a, a not a very perfect fit because uh, where I see a lot of uh, continuity and um, in 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 the whole history in colonial linguistics, the main uh, main thing seems to be to uh, to show how bad the colonial uh, linguistics was. Um, for example, Pukach 2011 uh, is a history of, of Africanistic in Germany. Very interesting one, actually. I really love that book. But um, then she talks about, uh, about co-authoring and, uh, and says that the, these uh, African co-authors are smothered to the point where they really say more about European culture than they do about indigenous African society. So um, uh, I will uh, put that back to the discussion at the end of the talk. So how are the practices of, of acknowledging um, sources of information? How are they different? Have they changed or not? In uh, not that much in African studies, but very popular and very common in, uh, in Amerindian studies is the idea of uh, when was the first contact and the first contact is then meant the first contact with the Western world. Uh, <clears throat> most Amerindian studies will, will try to find out when a particular group of people had, did meet uh, people from the West for the first time. So as a, just for the fun of it, I tried to find out how is that for the Iraqu, for example. Well, it, that is probably uh, uh, Oscar Bauman. You, you see a picture of him here, who, who made this uh, expedition to East Africa. The, you see the year 1893, that is when he reached uh, Iraqu land, but he's he already arrived in East Africa in 1891. Durch uh, Maasai land, through the Maasai area, that was uh, the title of his book. So uh, that was also new about his expedition that he would 
explore the area, the dangerous area of the Maasai. Um, then he reached the other end of the Maasai plains. He came to the book where, where he, well, he was nearly defeated. He had a, a real trouble there. He considered the book where even more dangerous than the Maasai and they lost a few men. From there, he went up to, um, to the, to the, uh, up the Rift Valley, but uh, he first uh, followed uh, Lake Manyara and the way, the place where he went up is more or less where you would now go from Arusha to uh, go up to Ngorongoro and then climb that road. So that area, it was not yet populated by Iraq who, uh, on his way up and he met only, uh, only Maasai on his way to Ngorongoro, but then continued to Lake Victoria on his way back. He, he went to Kondoa and then, and then uh, he, he went up to, uh, back to Bukwe through Alako area. Uh, against the advice of, of his, uh, his, his fellow uh, non-Tanzanians in Kondoa, because at, uh, at New Year's Day of 1983, he was having a nice meal there with the Arabs, the Arab traders in, in Kondoa town, who uh, gave him all my, all my kind of sweet uh, sweets. And then they told him, well, we never go through Alakwa area because the Basi area, because uh, it's too dangerous, we, we circumvent that. But um, he was courageous, he went right through it and indeed was attacked, um, but uh, the attackers fled when he started to, to answer the arrows uh, with his bullets. Um, that news spread probably because when he, when he uh, met then the, the Gorwa, he, uh, they were equally uh, feared. He uh, he was he didn't uh, have to uh, to fight anymore. And uh, and uh, joining the the Bukwe again, everything was peace and uh, peaceful now. Uh, they uh, they didn't uh, they didn't attack him anymore. And he was good friends with Sultan B of the Bukwe, and they helped him even. Uh, um, and they and when he went up to uh, on the Rift Valley, he he left some of his people behind in in Bookwood because he felt they were safe there. And he went with a smaller company up the Rift Valley with some guides from the from the Gorwa. And what he observed among ab about the Iraqu is that they were. Um, Oh, I was supposed to show some of these pictures that they that are from this uh, book. Um, this is one of the beautiful things about these explorers. You get these nicely drawn pictures. They are drawn after photographs and, um, of the landscape. Uh, I think this is uh, Hanang, but uh, it has a different name with him. It's confusing the names. He has completely different names for all the mountains and the rivers than what we are used to now. So that is a little bit of a puzzle. And here, this is a typical Iraqu house, uh, as the Iraqu have become so famous in the earlier literature that their houses were hidden and party in the ground. You don't see such houses anymore, but uh, these were all defense measures against the, the dangerous Maasai. And he observes about this, that this was very uh, similar to the way the Gorwa, the Fafiomi he calls them, uh, build their houses inside the hill. Um, what does he say about them? The natives are completely like the Wafiome. They also live in similar tembe houses and look possibly even dirtier, more adventurous and wilder. Nevertheless, they met us very kindly and gave the impression of peaceful people. As farmers, they really do outstanding things long stretches cover the well-kept square fields that have just been plowed and appear as red squares on the grassy slopes. Everyone that we could see seems to be briskly cultivating. So that was his first impression of the Iraq. Uh, yeah, another picture of some of these Iraq. 
I don't think that for the Iraqu this encounter uh, entered their their memory. I do have a memory of the first encounter of the of the Iraqu with outsiders, and this is in a song. I will we'll listen to the song. It is sung to me by John Amlali, the first person I worked with in in Bulu. Uh, every uh, session of elicitation, he would he would end with something cultural and often also a song. And uh, the song, all those songs, they recount history, but they don't give you the history as such. They just mention some names and some things, and then people will remember what that refers to. So one thing that is mentioned is Konki, the secret of Konki. Konki can keep a secret the way women do, because women are not supposed to talk about their initiation. They don't talk about it. And as silent as they are about initiation, Konki was silent about about the wound in his leg. He just said, yeah, he had broken it. But when it healed, it was clear that he had uh, a bullet had entered his, his leg. Um, and that was a meeting that they had at Magara, Kitulai, to meet the Germans. It's probably later, probably one of these punitive uh, expeditions that, uh, that, uh, that the Germans had to uh, against uh, anybody who didn't pay the taxes or was seen by them as uh, as rebellious uh, this was uh, predicted here i say by cyclo magena well cyclo magena is mentioned in the song cyclo magena is the famous uh, yeah the, the, the famous medicine man of the whole area of the the mid 19th century and he did a lot of predictions that were all came through, but this was a prophecy actually uh, from Malango Tsuut, one of the Naman, one of the, the uh, Nyilamba uh, clans among the, among the Iraqu. Let's listen to it. Mulwe Martini, Ladang Luatsu, oh. Masoko ma de kiri kunye kita wakar wakidi di tari sasi kara iwa hongoro kari imburu tabitet imburu tohung na hamamat imburu fisoro tunutsigit imburu firoro tunutsigit hembe hu hiahe kunga kata mara mai dir amena arsi doro lende dir hawate ado da kongki tiri ande Konki mati tin konki kaya aratun kalaa. So far, and the song goes on. Yeah, Caspi writes a little bit about the first encounters that uh, that uh, Rangi had. That was a bit earlier. That was uh, May, even in nineteen eighteen ninety two. There was already some German presence in 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 Kondoa. Um, so let me go on a little bit uh, about these uh, German expeditions. Baumann, but Baumann was not the only one. There were many of these expeditions into the interior of East Africa. What is the background of this? The background is that, um, of course, Germany was late in having colonies. And um, Bismarck uh, really hesitated about the, the need to, 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 for colonies. And uh, um, there were a lot of people in Germany and, and in particular the, the big trading houses in Hamburg, they were very keen on having colonies because they, they, they saw how, how they were losing out on the competition, uh, England and France. And uh, so uh, they actually financed the first that 1884 expedition to first Zanzibar and then from Zanzibar to the mainland of Tanzania to and what these people did, Carl Piet, Petros and some other, was to to arrange treaties, Schutzverträge, these kind of treaty treaties, uh, uh, of course formulated in German that um, that um, the Germans would uh, defend the people against any any attacks. And then, uh, and with those in hand, they went back to Germany in the hope that 
the state would, uh, would really uh, accept these treaties and uh, that that would be the beginning of a colony. But Bismarck, his reaction was in Stuck Papier mit Negerkreuzen drunter. He wasn't very impressed with these so called treaties. He, uh, he knew very well that this was just, uh, yeah, uh, just a piece of paper. Uh, but um, uh, the public opinion was uh, was uh, getting more and more in favor of, uh, of 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 starting colonies, and and there was uh, favored, for example, by the anti sclaverie committee, the anti slavery committee. An interesting way in 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 which the committee with that name argued that really we need we need to to help these poor people in uh, in Africa to defend them against the those horrible Arab slave drivers and uh, they had also just come into a sort of uh, the, the, there was a rebellion of Arab slaves of Arabs in East Africa I mean it was conceived as that by the Germans but that was then construed as a as a strong argument to uh, to start a colony uh, and and to uh, defend against uh, the threat of slavery, and in in that context, uh, the government then agreed to uh, try to have East Africa, Tanzania, Tanganyika as a colony. There were quite a few of these uh, of these uh, mostly geographers who, uh, who went on expedition to East Africa. Uh, I have some pictures of them here. I won't I won't discuss all of them. I'll, maybe I'll say a few words about some of them. Um, many of these people were geographers, as I said, or turned geography. Uh, people who had studied uh, mathematics, uh, young young men. Advent, full of adventure. Um, I think they there was a smart career move of them to uh, to move towards geography because in this period, four new professorships of geography of uh, the, the German colonies were uh, initiated in Germany. So some of these people, uh, yeah, they uh, they also got a nice job after their. Uh, expeditions. Top uh, row, first one is, uh, is uh, Hans uh, Meyer. Hans Meyer was uh, became very important in the whole Africanistic in the in the whole uh, colonial research in Germany. He was actually very instrumental in setting up these uh, these professorships. Uh, not for himself, first of all, but mostly for some others first. And um, he's, he was also a practical man. He, he came, his father was, uh, uh, worked for a publishing company. And, and so he was also, that was useful for him to, to make sure that uh, these, these reports helped a lot to get these reports published. Um, some of these uh, expeditions were then financed uh, by, well, also this anti, an, anti-slavery committee or other uh, um, Deutsch Ostafrika committee, those, those kind of organizations. But some of these men also, they came from rich backgrounds. So uh, it was private capital as well that, uh, that made it possible for some of them to uh, to, to do these expeditions. They were major operations, these expeditions. I mean, Bauman describes that in detail, how he organized his expedition. Well, more than 100 people and uh, yeah. So there was, there was uh, quite some organization to get it done and it must have been quite expensive too. They, um, they imported uh, also a lot of food in, in tins from all the way from back home and uh, they needed the best tents that they got made in uh, in England. So this, these were really well prepared uh, expeditions. Um, what is the second one? Uh, Meyer went several times. He he went three times. He 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 made it a point. He really wanted to be the first, the first, the first 
European to climb Kilimanjaro. I, I think he managed to climb Kilimanjaro the third time, something like that, uh, at least to go to the top. The Obst, then Ernst, uh, Karl Obst, he, uh, that's the Erich Obst, sorry, Karl Erich Obst is the second one. Um, he went uh, Adolf Fischer, then we have uh, Waldemar Werther. Waldemar Werther, he, uh, little anecdote, he, uh, he was found dead on the 30th uh, of November. It's my birthday. But in strange circumstances, because uh, uh, was it was he murdered or was he a murderer and tried to commit suicide? Uh, so his wife was also found dead, and then that I didn't, I couldn't find the solution to that mystery. But on Wikipedia, there's a little bit, a little uh, news clipping about about that uh, how he was found. Uh, Dempwolf, uh, Dempwolf on the second row, the first one. He's he's a bit different in a way. He was he is a real linguist, a uh, very well trained linguist. He was he has also been to other places. He had been to Southeast uh, Asia, to Namibia before he went to East Africa. And he spent some time there. I think he was working there as a as a medical doctor. And um, and as I said, he, uh, he was a well trained linguist. Sturman, Felis von Lushan, some of these people didn't actually go. Uh, um, von Lushan, for example, he, he is not uh, one of these people who went on expedition, but he was uh, instrumental in setting up the museum, uh, the Ethnographic Museum in, in Berlin, in Dahlem. So he made a point of collecting all, uh, taking in all these uh, things that those uh, explorers uh, brought back from uh, from East Africa. And then with his ten there, that's uh, on the right, Fritz Jäger, when they were trying to climb uh, Kilimanjaro. Jäger, he, he combined it with a little trip to Egypt, wanted to see the pyramids, and uh, that was made possible for example, because uh, he was he had such rich parents. Um, what else do I want to say about all these expeditions? Maybe I'll more will come. What I certainly want to say that some of these people, well, they they didn't spend long in places where they went through they they the real expeditions like Bauman's they 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 wanted to get on and so they didn't spend much time in in the places where they were um they did collect uh, all sorts of things uh, i'm still haven't found there must be uh, inventories of the things that brought back but Bauman brought back a lot of stones um, a lot of shells a lot of they're all in his book uh, and then they are uh, studied by the experts back home. So you see then uh, in the in appendix uh, studies on the different shells of East Africa by the shell expert of, uh, of Germany. Um, so that, that was the way in a, one of the ways in which science was done. So these data were collected, but then they were studied uh, by the people who didn't go there, but who studied them back home. Um, this is also true for this map that you see here. This is Carl Royle made this on Meyer's observations in his three trips to East Africa. So it's a map of the different types of houses. So you get these kind of analyses of, okay, here they have flat, flat roof houses, here they have round houses, here they have houses that are built in the mountain, here and the, all kinds of, uh, here, here they are, all kinds of different houses uh, they are then mapped uh, on and if he has an, some eight of these various maps of uh, giving an overview typology of of these kind of cultural uh, traits but apart from these uh, these uh, 
um, people on the expeditions, there were also the military were there, of course, there was a military presence of, of Germany in East Africa, and they were also used to collect data. So uh, before I, I go to this map, uh, let me mention Zeidel. Zeidel has an analysis of Gorla, 1900, but he did that on the basis of data collected by Lieutenant Blowning. And he writes it in his preface. And Lieutenant Blown, Blowning, uh, he went there with a questionnaire, a questionnaire that, that, that was prepared by, uh, by Zeidel that had some 124 short phrases that he just wanted to have translated into languages and into Gorba. And, and uh, Blowning came back with that uh, list. But Zaido complains too that the phonetics is not, not very reliable and it's a mess. And actually he has another manuscript by Kannenberg, uh, Hauptmann Kannenberg, so that's uh, another military man. Um, and he, uh, Kannenberg wrote a study of, uh, well, a number of languages, and, and nine different languages of the area. Uh, of the Papua uh, um, area, and and one of them was uh, was Gorba. Um, so he makes reference to that manuscript that he got through the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Germany. And there must be a manuscript, and I don't know when and where that is, but uh, there are manuscripts like that that these people used to base their analyses on. Um, and as I said, Dempol was also a medical doctor, but in the in the army, and and used his time there to do his uh, linguistic research. Another uh, military man is um, uh, Oberleutnant uh, von Sieg. Von Sieg was about uh, was in Sigida for about three years. Uh, this is the map from his book. He he then writes a a nice, uh, very rich ethnography of the Nyaturu, of the Vimi people. Um, he mentions his, his, uh, his uh, main informant, one of the Jumbis of the area, the very knowledgeable man. But he also mentions that in order to get the oral traditions of the history of the, of the Nyaturu, he had another uh, strategy. He asked um, some of his Askari, his soldiers, to, uh, to go around and to ask old people about uh, the history of the Waniaturu and to give them as much beer as they wanted. And, and then he thought that that way he could get more reliable information than when he would go there as a German. It's, um, uh, this book has a number, it's a, I think, well, it's very rich in all sorts of details. I, I show you some pictures just some pictures, and while I'll show the pictures, I will talk you, uh, tell you some things that, that struck me that I learned from that book. So he has an anecdote of, uh, of uh, a word for killing two buffaloes in one arrow shot, which reminds me that he, also Iraku has a, a specific word for killing two animals in one shot. He has the stick fight, typical stick fight. Uh, Andrew showed us a nice video not so long ago of the typical Iraqu stick fight. Well, Iraqu weren't the only one who, uh, who find that as a crucial part of their culture. He, uh, he mentions the greetings uh, in his uh, linguistics part of the, of the book. Uh, he mentions the greeting Sayu, which sounds very Iraqu to me, interesting. And also that there are different greetings to, to women which I also find remarkable. It, in, in Iraq too, there is a, a kind of tendency that, um, that you, any direct address of women uh, has to be marked for gender. That's why they have a distinction between two singular masculine and feminine, for example. Here's all the names there, information about kinship terminology, cattle terminology, including cattle colors. Yes some songs with texts in Rimi, some of the tales uh, among that tale of the, of the, of the, of the hare and the, and the rooster, the same one that we have in Iraku, but those tales are only written in, down in uh, German for 
South is the same as left and north is the same as right, which is also common in Iraku. And, um, but for the rest, his, um, what I find so fascinating about this whole book about uh, Naturu is that it seems, when you read it, it seems general, gener genuine uh, curiosity, you want to know things, and it's not really geared towards um, yeah, the needs of, of administration and control. So that is different, for example, when, when you read Klaus, Lieutenant Klaus, when he writes about the go go, uh, where he writes uh, ab about how to, whether, whether people are, uh, could be reliable uh, workers on the, on the, uh, and, and on the plantation, or whether they could be a good uh, uh, people working for to to carry carriers to carry things. Um, so very much towards how how can you use people and and less so the pure curiosity that I see with the von Zick. All these books, they uh, but what what. I find interesting in the introduction that Klaus has in his book about the Gogo -go is that, uh, that he says, this is about safe vanishing data. It's a quote that he has from Haddon. And he says that, uh, the, that it's valid to all of us civilized colonizers as we bring to the native culture to destroy their ancient customs and traditions twice as fast when a railway is constructed. I believe that today's Ngogo is no longer the same as he was three years ago. The present work has created, was created during my two years as a Schutztruppe doctor in Kilimatin, the military district in 1970-1909. So already the preoccupation with uh, yeah, uh, the diversity that's getting lost. This was just one year after Meinhof writes his uh, moderne forschung, moderne research of the African uh, languages, in which he also makes a plea for not only to study the big languages, but preferably don't forget the small ones because they will be lost soon. 1910. What I also find remarkable in this time in, uh, in uh, uh, Klaus, he collected his data, 97 to 99, but he writes his book in 1911 when he's back in, in Germany, well, it's now Poland in Kostrin. Uh, so very first, very fast in, in producing uh, the results of, uh, of the data collection. Uh, February uh, 1911, but the same year, this book was already published and published with all the, uh, the illustrations, uh, pictures, drawings, all of that. So that is complex uh, uh, publication business, but they were much faster than we are nowadays. Okay, here's this quote that I had from uh, Klaus in his Google book. Ko Larsen, oh, I'm so fascinated by this man, but let me check the time. No, I can't say too much about him. Um, he is Kohl, Ludwig Kohl, and his wife, they're both here in the picture, is uh, Margit Larsen. Um, but he calls himself after he married uh, Kohl Larsen. Um, very much emancipated, or maybe because he loved the beautiful Germanic name Larsen. Uh, both of his, of these motivations are, there's a, there's a biography, out of biography, I have it actually. Uh, that he uh, that he uh, that is published. Uh, somebody published it uh, and then not so long ago. Uh, he was a real adventurer. So he, I, in a way, he was there in colonial times. But he's a German, and he also really uh, does as if he's still one of those explorers. You know, he um, he has a stand in the in in near Lake Yassi with a with a Nazi party flag. Uh, uh, in front of his stand, as if uh, he, this is still Deutsch Ost Africa. Um, but at the same time, okay, he must have had sympathy for, for that party, but 
the way he writes a, about the people is full of love and empathy. He publishes, will come to that book at the very end, uh, Tainer Grosso Schwarzman. Um, uh, he, he has lived for some time before that in, in East uh, Africa as a, have, having a plantation. But then after that, he, he goes to Lapland, to the Sami, he, he does a uh, uh, ballon, he is, uh, what is it, on a, on a balloon, a hot air balloon. He does all sorts of things that, uh, that uh, every young boy dreams about. And I think he has stayed a young boy his whole life. I think his, his, his wife was probably more of the, of the archaeologists that that, uh, that he was they collected a lot of stuff that got published later and still is used for the archaeology um and in a way i think his mind was 30 years earlier than when he actually lived more to say about it but i won't because there is this beautiful story of the four maasai women uh, explaining how the iraqu became uh, christian and then I have two pictures of men. Sorry about that, but I don't have the nice pictures of those four, four Maasai women. The story is is published in in Grandin's Eloy Grandin. He's a white father working at. Uh, I hope he's still working there. Probably not anymore. I met him in the 1988 in in Tabora, in the archives of the white fathers in in Tabora, and he had published then uh, self published a, a book uh, about this story of how you know, the fa four Maasai women Christianized the Iraqu uh, people. What is the story? It's too nice not to tell it. Mm -hmm. So uh, you had all these punitive expeditions by the Germans in East Africa. And of course, the Maasai were one of those people who were not very well behaved and uh, had to be uh, put into order. And uh, at one of those occasions, uh, they, they uh, arrested women, uh, a number of them, 15, I think. Um, and uh, there was a, a practical problem because there was no prison in, in Deutsch Ost Africa, where no, no women prison. So there was no place they could put them. So they found a solution that they made a deal with one of the new parishes on a little island in Lake Victoria that uh, they would bring those women there and of course it would be like a prison no maasai woman would would die, try to swim across to the to the mainland and they stayed for a time for quite some time on this island in the catholic mission there white father's mission and uh, um uh, when they heard that the mission was opened in uh, in Bulo in the Iraqo area they they asked for permission to uh, to move there, and that was granted. So they walked. They walked with the caravan all the way from uh, from Lake Victoria, from Bukoba to to Iraqo area, where they were taken up by this new mission in Tlawi. Um, and um, yeah, so they had become Christian on that island, but they were Maasai. They were not Iraqo, but the priest there for years and years they had been working for years those white fathers without without a single convert to christianity uh, the iraqo people were very impressed by these strange uh, white men trying to tell them uh, about god they knew about god so they they had the first they tried to be in in Irkadao, the core land of uh, of the Iraqo, and then they were chased from there. They got a lot of help from the chief Isara to get out of it. Uh, then they were given a plot in near Tlawi, and they were given that plot because people knew that that was infested with leopards and indeed quite some of the white fathers of the early days. They they died uh, to the leopards in that area. But they continued to work and to continue to try, even with years without any convert. But then with those Maasai women, things changed because they, those Maasai women, they, they made a rapport uh, with the Maasai, with the Iraqu ladies. And in traditional culture in Iraqu land, it was that um, if, if, you, if a child is born in strange and not normal circumstances, then it has to be 
left in the bush. Of course, uh, what the Iraqi women did is they left it in the bush very close to the mission. So these kids, these babies were taken up by the mission, raised by the Maasai women, and these became the first Iraqi uh, uh, Catholic sisters. And, uh, and this is how Iraqi then finally became Christianized. Actually, this man, Laguin, uh, he is, uh, he married one of those four Maasai women that eventually decided to stay in, uh, in Tlavi, in Tlavi mission. So he is the first Iraqi man to become Christian, become Iraqi by marrying this uh, uh, Maasai Catholic lady. In that time, so in the early, early uh, 20th century, Schregel, Schregel, you saw his picture just in the last slide. He wrote the first uh, Iraqi grammar, well, grammar, it's only 16 pages, it's handwritten manuscript. It is kept in the archive of the White Fathers in Rome. I, I visited them there and I, I couldn't, uh, yeah, it's long ago, I couldn't make pictures, uh, no mobile phones, no iPads only could take some some notes it's not very precise in uh, in the phonetic uh, transcription but he did recognize um, all the, the the challenging sounds so the the frangial sounds are are written with umlaut above uh, the vowels not making a distinction between the her and the uh, the voice and the voiceless ones and then but but they do have, they do have already, they, they try to make a distinction for the t and the t and all those sounds, but it's not very consistent. Later, um, Verhoeven uh, also uh, wrote the grammar and, uh, and Schegel and Verhoeven were by the way, both Dutch uh, white fathers and Verhoeven later made a grammar also of Naturo. So um, they did a lot of work uh, in linguistics, also these white fathers, because they wanted to have all their prayer books in Iraqu, and they were published in Iraqu. And uh, another factor there is that uh, the, um, in the white father rule, the rule how they should live, there is this obligation that you have to develop a hobby. So white fathers have, and many of them developed uh, linguistics as a hobby. And linguistics they developed as a hobby also because in their training they were um, they spent first the first training was in Algeria where they were they had to learn Hebrew and, and Arabic so they were they knew Hebrew and Arabic before they went to places like Iraq and obviously that helped them it's also they say that actually Iraq could or should be written with the Arabic alphabet but then in the end they didn't do that Lutheran mission. I, I'm going to uh, to hurry up and to skip a few, also because I'm less prepared for these later areas. Uh, this is a picture of uh, of Fröjdis Nordpistat, who devoted her whole life to uh, working on Iraq, grammar, uh, but also uh, teaching and and teaching uh, how to read and write in Iraq, or very smartly saying developing courses, how to read and write Swahili through Iraq. That's the way she could get it accepted by the authorities. You see here with John Kamlali, who had just uh, developed this uh, hair in this uh, strange style because he thought that was the old style of the of the Iraqi people. And maybe it's right that uh, everybody in, in Bulu laughed at him, but I think he would have been uh, popular right now with his Rasta kind of hair. Yeah, this was in 1992. Uh, there's a lot more of the Lutheran mission in the other area. Howard Olson, of course, from the Nyaturu, did a lot of work for the songs, but also for the grammar of the, of the Nyaturu. This Martin van Kimenade, uh, oh no, he is not in the Lutheran, but anyway. Um, I want to skip this. What do I share? What should I say? He is from Kemenade. He wrote about the Sandao. He was a Holy Ghost father. Uh, Mine of I, I have I mentioned Mine of I have maybe I should have. 
Meinhof, of course, the big Africanist in, in, uh, uh, in Hamburg and with this huge network of missionaries that he got data from and with his uh, really building up Africanistic uh, for East Africa and Bantu and Hamitic in uh, what he called Hamitic. But I'm also impressed by, by his, his travel to East Africa. He, uh, he, he went then to East Africa and, and just after that you get 15 grammar sketches published in Owens only four years time. Uh, yeah, we, do, we are all very lazy now. Um, uh, really in the, in the colonial time, of course, with Guthrie, Whiteley and Tucker and Brian, uh, they all were in, in Bulu, they all worked on Iraq. Uh, the other day, uh, Richard was talking about the Hadza curse. If you work on Hadza, then, then you, you don't uh, finish it. Well, there was some, something like the Iraqu curse. G uh, Guthrie has notes on the Iraqu, but in his will, it is stipulated that they should be burned. Whiteley worked on the Iraqu, but couldn't make head nor tail out of it. He did, but he was wise enough to publish it and say so in his preface that he doesn't understand. But OK, this is what he found. Tucker, uh, it was also a story with Tucker, but he he was in, he did some recordings of, of Iraku as well. Uh, I'm going to current times. Yes, uh, last slide before the conclusions is that I, I want to uh, emphasize also that there's a lot of popular literature about the Tanzanian Rift Valley. That, that links um, the adventure to, to, to the adventure writing to the uh, academic uh, research. Um, in a way that, that is a continuation because the, um, those, those, those books by Bauman and the early explorers, they really read like, uh, like uh, diaries of adventurers. But uh, just to mention a few here, Fouquet, Iraku, in French, en français. Um, Grandin, the archivist from Tabora, did, was full of this dédain about this publication. And he, he was just a fantasist. But um, well, he wrote a popular book about the Iraku. Uh, the Tree Where Man Was Born is, of course, was very popular and famous by Peter Matisse. Matisse and is a kind of, it's a book about that area and how we, in the 60s, how he travels around the whole area, about his travels, very colonial way of traveling actually, but uh, how we met all the different scientists who were there. And, and he, he links it a, a lot with the existing academic literature of the times. Uh, Richard showed this Hadzabe book, which is indeed a beautiful book on the, published by Daudi Peterson and on, on the Hadza people um, and with a, very, a, a book that you, can, that you can sell to tourists, but where they can also have an idea that they, uh, they, they, are, they link a little bit of the, uh, to the results of, of um, academic research. And then Kleiner Grosser Schwarzerman is written by Symbol Janira, oh boy. And, um, but it's written by Cole Larsen, but he tells the story of this, this young boy. And um, I think it has become very popular in Germany at the time with all the empathy that you can have, have for the little boy from, uh, from, from Tanzania, from the Deutsche Ost Africa and how he lives and the way he lives and how he is happy and uh, has difficult times. Uh, very influential, I think. And an early example of, uh, of biographies written by Western researchers as if the, the um, Africa, the, the Tanzanian is speaking. Conclusions, my subtitles, materials, memories, methods, and motivations in a different order. Let me start with the materials. Um, in all of these things, we've seen a lot of pictures. There must be more. So these are some thoughts that I have uh, when, when going through all of this. 
Some of them refer to documents that must be there somewhere, like Seidel when he says this document by Kallenberg. I know myself that there are wax rolls. Mine of uh, did recordings and made some uh, on wax rolls, and they are in the uh, museum in Dalheim. And and they have been uh, um, they have been digitized. But uh, there are two steps that you have to do with these things. First, you have to make them available, and uh, and so that you don't have to to uh, to put them on on that uh, instrument anymore. But then they have to be cleaned for all the noise that is there. I listened to the uncleaned ones uh, for what is supposed to be in Bugu, but it's really just noise. Um, there are Kolasin, when he writes about all, all his travels, he, he, he talks about recordings that he made on, 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 long, on, on actual records. I don't know whether they exist. He 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 mentions a film that he made about a, a dance uh, that that should be in the film academy in 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 uh, Berlin. Uh, Schregel, the uh, Grandin, uh, writes about a picture book of pictures with Schregel that must be somewhere. He mentions by whom, with whom in in Irakulent. I was in Osaka in the Museum of Technology. They have from all those Japanese missions. They have all those archives, so there is a lot, a lot more material that becomes more and more uh, interesting and interesting. I think as well to make them available in a kind of uh, digital return that uh, that uh, that would be nice. That if these, if in Tanzania people have access uh, to these pictures and see the way. Um, they have been portrayed a uh, hundred years ago. Uh, our own materials, uh, mine are actually not so much available. I'm trying my best. Uh, and something that I notice is that nowadays is uh, you must have digitized and in an archive, otherwise it doesn't exist. I wouldn't know where I could put my, my notebooks, my, my scribbles difficult to decipher, but anyway, uh, um, I'm sure that uh, the, the library or Leiden library doesn't want them because they don't have space for all of that. So yeah, something I just want to uh, share with you that there is that issue. And, uh, and there are more and more, of course, on cyberspace, they're very useful sources. And I've just given you one link here where they've Put a lot of the digitized older sources uh, of the German explorers available to everyone. Um, for a lot of these uh, early research, there are the diaries. Uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of reports on how they collected that data by telling these people on the pers these people telling their personal circumstances. Um, I, I, it's not in my thesis. I, I have a preface, but I don't talk about about uh, the way I, how I went about uh, going around in Iraq area. I think that is changing nowadays a little bit in in, in documentation. But um, you do get. I didn't. I didn't keep a diary. Uh, something that I regret now. Um, but. Uh, Dempfel, for example, he kept diaries, and I've just orders, ordered his one that came out that was published last year, uh, his diary of East Africa. So you get a lot of background on how data were collected uh, for the old days, maybe also for the new days, but not always for the time in between. Um, the methods, they were all very, they varied a lot. You have very long time presence missionaries who stayed there the whole life to people who stayed only two, one or two days. We have, you have long distance field work in the 1900s with people giving them the questionnaires and, and asking a lieutenant to, to get it filled out. And you have people who, like Caspi, who says, well, I spent just three years in the field and I know about uh, the taxonomy because of participant observation. Uh, some people have one main informant, some have many, and, and some trained on local researchers, and that is through the whole period. Uh, some don't name the people that they got the information from, some do, some acknowledge that, uh, uh, give them credit, some make them co-author, some make them even author, 
So there's a lot of variation right through the whole area about how people deal with that. And uh, there's, there's no clear direction there. And, and nowadays I notice that we are more and more into trouble with mentioning names because of the ethics codes and laws in, in Europe. And also there is this now this tendency that, yeah, if I hear from my social science uh, colleagues more than, than from us, is we have to do co-creation. So what we do is actual co-creation, which to some extent is true, but uh, the same sentiment that, that I mentioned in my first slide of Pugac about this co-authors, co-creation, yes, but in the end, I decide uh, uh, what is there in the in the way it is formulated, isn't it? And uh, so, and if you if you call your PhD research co-creation, well, in the end, it's you who defend and you get who get the title. So there are limits to that. The motivation, I think, has been curiosity all through. Endangered languages, vanishing cultures, has been an argument all through times, but also the role importance of that African languages have in communication. This is my life's last slide and very sorry to end it in such a sad note, but I want to dedicate it to the memory of my big example, Peter Meiskin, who passed away last night after just a few months of uh, disease of cancer of the lymphic layers, the lymph uh, cancer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mart, for your presentation. Um, I think we can now begin the question and answer section. The question and answer section will be open to voice questions as well as written ones. If you would like to ask a question, just raise your hand in the nonverbal controls, which are present underneath the participant panel, and I will send the request to your mutes. If you prefer to ask a written question, it's also still possible. You can do so using the Zoom chat module, and as usual, I will read out the question. Please remember that the webinars are being recorded so that if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and will be released on the YouTube channel. Honey, uh, it's, it's mostly men. Uh, up, up to now, uh, uh, no, it's not up to now because uh, in the Iraqi studies, we have Crispina, we have Marta Coro, we have, uh, we have very fierce, for, uh, fierce, strong women there. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm sh of course uh, with Cole Larson. It is that that brings out your point maybe even more saliently. I think uh, Margit Lars uh, Larson was uh, more of the brains of that uh, uh, that couple, but uh, he has the credit and he had the professorship. Is there more in the chat? Um, not that I can see, uh, but I see that there's a raised hand from Ahmed Sosa, so I'll ask him to unmute. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation, Martin, and it's very detailed and it uh, covers like a lot. Uh, I'm just like curious about the period, uh, like before the colonial period. Uh, I don't know if there is anything significant has been done before 1896, which uh, no. may be part of the research. The second question is the, about the point you raised at the beginning about the focus of the um, researchers in Africa, maybe currently on a uh, critical side more than the work on documenting or working on the languages themselves. Uh, yeah, that, that would be nice if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, um, yeah, so no, I mean, in the um, Bauman is, is also is, is in a way the beginning and then and then it is remarkably fast the, the amount of research done by the Germans in the beginning is is truly remarkable. Um, of course, there were there were some some people who, who would who traveled through Africa a little bit earlier, but for East Africa, um, there's not much and certainly not much linguistic information that comes out of that. Um, yeah, nowadays, uh, um, and also earlier, um, 
what I had wanted to do. In a way, I did a little bit by, by showing you the picture that I have of North Pistat with John Kamlali. John Kamlali was uh, uh, the first Iraqi guy that I worked with, but he also worked, he wasn't my main source of information, but he became the main source of uh, information of Kat Catherine Schneider, an anthropologist who came later. Uh, but he he had his own interests. It, he came to me. I didn't find him. He found me, and um, and he is uh, one of those examples of of what I would call the the speaker researchers. And and there are many. There are many all over Africa, but also many in in our area. And um, it's something that maybe I really want us to talk about at some point. Maybe even more than now. Uh, I, I find it uh, crucial uh, that we link to them, and it's also not easy. Um, with some of them, I have noticed that uh, that that they're well, maybe also uh, very uh, understandably so. They're, it's their research. They they they. They're a bit afraid of sharing it with people like uh, like me. On the other hand, you want to help them to to do more, to uh, to to have the equipment if they need that, but also to to try to uh, to get it out. Uh, it's a challenge not to not to put your own interest uh, into their minds and. Uh, 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 and I think it's the most important, one of the most important forces for, well, revitalization, I wouldn't call it that, but fight, vitalizing uh, all the languages to, uh, to have these activists, uh, to help the activists in the, in the area. But it's already a challenge to, to get to meet them, to get to know them. And then one of the things we wanted to do with also with Andrew and Richard, and I hope we still can do in the future, is to have a, a conference in, in the area where all these people are also uh, as much part of the conference as the, the audience that we have here. In the, in the, shall I respond to the questions in the chat? Uh, Let me read it out first. That might okay. Help. Yeah. Um, so I think the first one that came up was from Sara Petrolino, who asks, why do you think there is so much variation in the names for mountains and landmarks reported by earlier explorers? Uh, um, it's a... I don't know. <laughs> I'm wondering myself. Um, and it's not that much variation. It's the... Um, uh, Bauman, for example, he says that name that I heard for, for Mount Anang is wrong. It should be Gurui or something, uh, some, a name that I don't know. So I have the impression that for Bauman, for example, all that he, he his names are uh, Maasai names. And, and that for him, it's uh, um, that, that, but he still has the idea that there is only one name. And uh, that's how we can say that some other names are just mistakes. Um, but, uh, and then later when we had the, the, the British administration, they, they determined, they, they didn't, I think they simply didn't use all the knowledge from the German uh, period to, uh, to put down the names on their maps. Um, so for Iraqi district, for example, the, uh, with John, John Kamala, he went through the whole long list of names of primary schools to, to give the correct uh, writing, uh, correct spelling of those names, and also some explanation of what kind of name it was. But um, I think it's, uh, that, that is why the current names are different, because it was different administrations are different from those that were done by the first explorers. But I, I should look into that. I don't know. This is my hunch. Then I see, I think it's just a remark from uh, Amani Lusekelo, who says, uh, Kilimatin, the area, it appears to be the home of Datoga rather than Gogo by uh, 1911. A friend, uh, Majida, who writes about Datoga, treats uh, Kilimatinda as a home of Datoga. 
Uh, yeah, uh, it is also when you when you read early sources on 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 um, yeah, Papua. Uh, so by this Klaus, it would be so nice to have all these uh, old works uh, translated into English. And because I'm Adi, I don't know whether you can read German. But um, he, 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 he does talk about the Toka presence and about the presence of all sorts of other people in that area. So he talks about uh, the Wangomvia who are there. He talks about uh, Kamba who are there. And he also talks about, uh, about the different Tatoka people who are there. And then he has some ideas about they're similar to whom and to, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I think that uh, the, Already in that time, 1911, uh, yeah, Datoga were uh, spread in, through a huge area in, uh, in, in Tanzania, yes. And I see a remark from Bonnie um, about the earlier comments about how there were only men before 1990s. And she remarks there was at least one woman uh, before the 1990s. Her name was Dorothea Blake. Yeah. And she wrote an article for the South African Journal of Science in uh, 1931. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I see an other uh, question from Amani Lusikelo, um, which is Segilo Magina. He is also mentioned among the Hadza people, mainly in personal names. Based on personal names, would you place him among the Iraku? Amani, uh, I love Segilo. Um, I would place him among the Iraku, although we know very well he's Boradik Datoga. Uh, he, to me, a book about Saigilo Magena is what we need for the history of Tanzania. Uh, so much about the history books is not about people when you come to Africa, but uh, Saigilo Magena was a major force. Everybody talks about him. So he is present in the colonial literature. Von Zick writes about him as well, who writes about him, Yaturu. Uh, so uh, all the people who go through the area write about Saigilo Magena or Saigilo or Sagilo, whatever way they call him. Uh, but also all the uh, all the people, the Maasai have songs about him, uh, the Mbukwe have songs about him. I mean, all the people in the whole area have a memory of Saigilo Magena. So one day we should, we should uh, compile a book uh, about, and I think your friend... Uh, Samuel is also interested, and uh, a colleague of his also in Saigilo Magena. He, uh, yeah, he is everywhere. He is the major, he was, uh, so yes, I put him among the Iraqu because for the Iraqu, he was one of the, the major uh, figures of power, uh, although he was uh, uh, not Iraqu in, in tribal language. And he had major competitions with another Iraqu who was not Iraqu, but then uh, Nyelamba in origin, Nadebea, where they fought about the boundaries of rain. Yeah. I see that Bonnie just uh, put a very helpful link uh, about this in the chat. So uh, make sure to look at that if you're interested. Yes, thank you, Bonnie. Uh, John is a student of mine, and I always uh, force my students to write a, a short encyclopedic article in the first year. And, and, and John did an excellent job, and this is the result of that uh, when he was in my course. Yes. Then I don't think I see any more. Oh, I see a raised hands, uh, Andrew. Hi Martin, thanks for this sort of um, this sort of um, review of uh, of our, I guess, intellectual or academic forefathers, and a lot of them were fathers, and a lot of them had their own sort of problematics. I mean, we talk about the colonial presence and the violence that was visited on the people of of the area, and we also talk about you know the different the different agendas that people brought to their research, what they were trying to prove, etc. Um, I wonder, sort of, if we look at this generally, what, as a research network, what do you think we need to be sensitive towards? What do we need to sort of take, you know, out of this legacy? What are the major questions that, 
deserve to, to continue to be asked and looked at? And what are the things that, that we need to be careful of? Because I mean, we are still citing these, these people uh, in, 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 in a way, shape or form. So do you have any thoughts on that? What, what, what do we, how do we respond or how do we sort of, how do we work with this legacy of people that have come before us? Um, yeah, so I, I, um, I think it's material and so I want to use it. Um, I think a lot of the material is, uh, uh, a lot, a lot of the material is actually, uh, uh, reliable or at least it's, it's, um, it's, you can have an idea of how reliable it is, uh, uh, even if, if there's no sound uh, with it. Um, I, you know, it, it's true that, that there are issues around all these people. And, um, and that's why I spoke about uh, Cole Larson, the way I spoke about him. Um, I, I, I fear I fear the the hundred years from now when people talk about me. Um, so, yes, uh, I I would make a difference between the data and uh, and sources about uh, and 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 the way things to be said about. Um, the situation and parts of the situation that we can certainly disprove of uh, nowadays. So uh, yes, I mean um, these these the German army have done horrible things in in East Africa. Uh, yet when when I when when I listen to the, to the memories that, that these old men in Iraqi country share with me about the Germans. Uh, it's full of admiration about how strong they were, about how, how the things that they built still stand, how, how good the roads were, and, and even how fierce they were. Because uh, I remember this old man telling me that he still remembers German. So I told him, okay, tell, tell him, talk German to me. So that came his German, and that was his German for the number of beats with the whip that they would get if they would misbehave. But he was proud of that <laughs> in, a, in a very strange way. So um, yeah, uh, I think we can uh, use much more of uh, the, all the things that were collected because we can see changes through time if we use the collections of the early days and, uh, and I would not refrain from doing that uh, because they were collected in a period uh, where atrocities were, were happened and they did happen yeah if this is my fake and uh, answer maybe reaction so yes, uh, let's let's look at them and and take them for um, for what they can tell us. I have a meeting actually. I have to leave. I think. Okay, then uh, we'll just uh, close the question and answer section with that. I, th I think we're basically ready anyway. So um, thank you again for a really interesting presentation. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Uh, looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 21st of April, um, and the details will be uh, in the news uh, letter uh, over the next coming month. Uh, I see we're losing Marta. But uh, thank you, Martin, again, uh, and I hope to see everyone again at our next webinar.